Here at Doxedo Bloom, we're excited about making disciples who impact the city and nations. We hope you enjoy today's message. It's Easter time and we are looking at some of the I am statements that Jesus made all throughout the Gospel of John. To the dead man, Jesus was life. To the prostitute, he was a second chance. To the one waiting, he was the long awaited answer. Who is Jesus to you? Let's look at some of these I am statements. All throughout the book of John, he says things like, I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. And today we want to look at the statement he made in John chapter 8, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So I want to encourage you from wherever you are watching this, open up your Bible as we read together. John chapter 8 verse 12 says, Jesus spoke once more to the people and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You see, Jesus is saying that when we know him, when we accept the invitation for salvation and relationship with him, we live in the light. We no longer live in darkness. In fact, God always associates himself with life. The very first statement we have from God himself in Genesis 1 says, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Genesis 1 verse 3. You see, light is all also always in contrast with dark or darkness. You see, God is always associated with light and then the enemy or Satan is always associated with darkness. Colossians 1 verse 12 to 14 says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his son. You see, God is light. And when Jesus makes this statement that he is the light of the world in John chapter 8, it's actually after one of the most redemptive moments in history. Let's read together John chapter 8 from verse 1. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he started teaching them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the sand with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. And eventually Jesus stood up again and said, All right, but let the one of you who has never sinned be the first one to throw the stone. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest straight through to the youngest, until only it was Jesus and this woman left. Then Jesus stood up and said to her, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, Lord. And Jesus answered, neither do I. Go and sin no more. And then he makes the statement where he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You see, this passage kind of reveals three things to us. It reveals something about the law of God. It reveals something about the love of God, but it also reveals something about the grace of God. But firstly, it kind of reveals the law of God, the law of Moses that he gave to his people in the Old Testament. And the law is good for one thing. It proves that you and I, we are guilty. How did they know this woman was guilty for adultery? Because there was a law that said you must not commit adultery. We can read from verse 3 to 6 again. It says, As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought the woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Now, two things to note from those sentences. Firstly, who brought the woman? It was the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the religious elite. They knew the law back to front. They could recite it by heart. And then secondly, it says that she was caught in the act of adultery. That's awkward, all right? That literally means that she and a man who was not her husband were somewhere getting busy and they were caught in this act and dragged out. Only the women, take note, brought in front of the crowd 
So that can kind of lead to the conclusion that she was probably not wearing any clothes. She was probably naked, had no time to gather herself again. And this is definitely the most humiliating moment of her life. It goes on to say, teacher, now the <clears throat> religious elite, elite are speaking to Jesus and they say, the law of Moses says to stone her. What did the law do? It proved her to be guilty. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? It goes on to say they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. Why would they do that? Because they wanted to catch Jesus in the act of making a mistake. If he said, yes, stone her, have her be punished, then his entire ministry of grace and reconciliation would have been out the window. But if Jesus said, oh, it's okay, just forgive her this time, then it would also completely bypass the law, which he would not want. The law proves us to be guilty. How did they know she was guilty? Because the law said so. Why does that matter? Why make a point of that in a sermon? Because the truth is, friend, you and I, we are guilty. Compared to the law, compared to the utmost holy standard of God, you and I, we fall short. We have been caught in the act of adultery with this world and we are brought forth, we are brought to, to God, guilty, deserving of punishment, just like this woman in John chapter 8. Why does that matter? Because not until you and I see ourselves as sinners in need of a savior, it's only then when the good news will actually become good news for you and me. You see, good news is only good news if it has personal implications on your life. Otherwise, it's just news. Romans 7 verse 7 says that the law shows sin. And compared to God's standard, compared to the law, compared to His holiness, you and I, we fall short. Just like this woman in John chapter 8, she fell short of God's standard and she deserved punishment. But it doesn't end there because that is where Jesus meets her and that is where Jesus meets us. Because you see, this passage also reveals something about God's love and God's grace. It says that eventually Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. Now, what exactly Jesus wrote, we aren't sure. Uh, but some scholars have led us to believe that certain Greek translations of this passage actually explain that Jesus was busy writing down the sins that these Pharisees, the teachers of the law, had secretly been committing. He was bringing their sins into the light as well. They keep on demanding an answer. Jesus doesn't fall for that. He keeps writing and they keep demanding. And eventually he stands up and he says, all right, stone her. The first one who has never, ever committed a sin and who has never even wanted to commit a sin, you can be the one to stone her. And all of them start leaving one after the other until eventually we arrive at this moment where it's only Jesus and this woman caught in the act of adultery like you and me. And he asks her, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord she said. And Jesus makes this monumental statement where he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. You see, this is probably one of the most graceful statements of all time because Jesus looks at this woman. He looks at her in her most vulnerable state, the most humiliating moment of her life, and he speaks grace. Maybe you need to hear some grace today. Maybe you are feeling far away from God. Maybe you are thinking, I've done too much. I've said too much. I've gone too far. I've made too many mistakes. God can never possibly forgive me or accept me again. And for you, my friend, today, there's good news. Because just like Jesus in this moment extends grace to this woman during the most horrific moment of her life, Jesus is able to extend grace to you. But you see, like this woman in John 8, she had accusers. She had people dragging her in front of God's presence going, she is guilty. She deserves punishment. And they were right. She did deserve punishment. But just like she had accusers, you and I, we also have an accuser, the devil, the enemy of God. In fact, Revelation 12 verse 10 describes Satan as the accuser who accuses God's people day and night before him. 
But the good news today, my friend, for you and me, is that just like the accusers in John chapter 8 were silenced in front of Jesus, so also our accuser in front of God has been silenced. How did that happen? It's through Jesus, through his life, through his ministry, through his death and his resurrection, Jesus was able to silence our accuser who would drag you and me before the father saying, this child, this son, this daughter, they deserve punishment. And we did. We did deserve punishment because again, compared to God's standard, we fall way short. We've been caught in the act of adultery with this world. But because Jesus lived a perfect life, because he came to earth to die a death you and I should have died, he is able to, for this woman, extend grace and for you and me to extend grace. Our accuser has been silenced, just like these accusers. But the good news goes on. It doesn't end there because not only does Jesus not condemn her, and not only does Jesus forgive her, he says, you know, I don't condemn you. I don't, I'm not here to stone you. I'm not here to punish you. But he actually gives her hope. And that's the last thing this passage actually reveals to us. He doesn't leave her in that space of shame and guilt and vulnerability. Because the statement Jesus makes is he said to her, I do not condemn you. So go therefore and sin no more. There's this urgency in the way Jesus is talking. He says, he says to her, walk away from this life. He empowers her. He doesn't just pardon her. He doesn't just extend grace. He doesn't just forgive her. He actually urges her, walk away from this life. Walk away from this guilt. Walk away from this pain. Walk away from whatever is holding you back from following me with all your heart. And that is the invitation for you and me as well. Jesus doesn't only forgive. He doesn't only just cover my sin so that I can go to heaven. He actually empowers me and he invites me. Walk away from the darkness. Walk away from the bondage that is keeping you from following me with all your heart. And then right after this incredible moment of grace, Jesus makes a statement. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, get this. He says, you won't have to walk in darkness. Why does he say that? He's saying you are no longer bound to the sin that is keeping you away from me because I am now your life. He finishes the sentence by saying, because you will have the light that leads to life. What is he talking about? He's talking about himself. That's why he says, I am the light. I am the life. If you follow me, you forfeit darkness. And this is our hope today. <laughs> All these thousands of years later, that is our hope. I no longer have to walk in darkness. I don't have to submit to sin. I don't have to allow bondage to keep me away because Jesus extended grace to me with free salvation and he urges me, he empowers me to walk away from whatever is keeping me in bondage. You see, suddenly this statement where he says, I am the light of the world, it's a bit more weighty, right? Because all of a sudden it becomes clear that he is not only the light of the world, because that's kind of general, but in this moment he becomes the light to this woman's world. Her life was never the same again. He meets her at her most vulnerable. He sees her at her weakest, at her worst, stuck in bondage and slavery. He looks at her and he says, I do not condemn you. I forgive you, but go. Walk away from this life that is keeping you in bondage. Follow me. Have you had a moment like that? Have you had a moment where you are confronted, where the accuser has brought you in front of the father saying, this son, this daughter, deserving of punishment, deserving of death. And he would be right. But have you had that moment where Jesus just confronts you and floors you with his grace, with his forgiveness, but then also with the invitation of my child, follow me. Don't walk in darkness. Follow me, because if you follow me, you will have the light that leads to life. I want to end off with a last encouragement, and this is so practical, but just think about this for a moment. 
when you arrive at home and it's late at night and you switch on the living room light or the bathroom light or the kitchen light or whatever, what happens? The light goes on, right? Pretty clear. What happens when you t flick a switch? You don't see the shadows or the darkness and the light competing with one another, kind of deciding, you know, is the light going to go on? Is it not going to? Are there only parts of the room that will be filled with light? Are there parts of the room that will still be in complete darkness? No, that doesn't happen. What happens when you flip a switch? The light goes on. You see, darkness can never compete with light. You don't see darkness deciding whether or not it should leave once someone flips a switch and turns on the light. And just like that, the accuser, the one who brings us before the father saying, deserving of death, deserving of punishment. And they, he's right. But the thing is, when you are in Jesus, when you've accepted that free gift of salvation, he says he makes his home inside of us. So there's light. It's not an arm wrestling contest anymore. It's not this battle between good and evil and light and dark because Jesus says in Colossians that when we are in him, we are transferred from the domain of darkness and we are brought into the kingdom of light. Darkness doesn't decide whether or not it wants to leave. It leaves. There's no competition, friends, between light and dark. If you follow Jesus, in his words, he says, you will have the light that leads to life. And that's my prayer for you today. If you are feeling full of shame or if you are feeling vulnerable and broken, like you've been brought by the accuser in front of God and there's no excuse for your behavior, there's no excuse for the way your life has turned out at this moment, then you are in good hands, my friend. Because just like Jesus, he met this woman in John chapter 8 and he makes this monumental statement where he says, I do not condemn you, but go, sin no more, walk away from the bondage, walk away from whatever is keeping you from following me. Because when you follow me, you will have the light that leads to life. I pray that for you. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Make sure that you get connected to this family on mission by joining us at one of our Sunday services.